All right, coach, put me in. Let's go. <laughs> coach, I want to play. Put me in, coach. <laughs> oh, man. How many how many times have you heard that over the years? Um, not much. That's one of my rules of the beginning of the season. If you ask to play, you won't. So don't. Um, so the uh, second rule is if you want to talk to me about your kid as a parent, I will have any conversation you want to have off the field about anything other than my decisions about your kid's playing time. So you can Got it. you can take your helicopter blades off and don't rotor around me because I don't do well with helicopter parents. Um, I will be happy to talk about the skill sets your kid needs to learn to earn more playing time, but don't talk to me about playing time and stuff like that. So Got it. Um, anyway. And- and is rule number three, if you want more playing time, refer back to rule number one? Yeah, you want it to <laughs> one and subset two. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Well, let, let's uh, let's start from the beginning, man. I, I know that you uh, you grew up in an environment that was kind of challenging. I want you to start with that. Well, uh, dad left home. Mom and dad were divorced when I was four. Uh, my father actually died earlier this year, and I got a phone call a couple weeks after to tell me. Um, I had zero relationship with him. Uh, mom was married and divorced five times. Uh, fourth father took out a 38 caliber pistol after downing about a gallon of scotch one night and shot up the house, shot at me down a hallway. I had to dive out a window that night to, uh, survive the night and call the cops. And he was reloading when the cops came in and my mom was coward in the attic. Um, so, yeah, I kind of grew up with a lot of dysfunction and a fair amount of trauma and um, not only fatherlessness, but um, the surrogates that came along were maybe worse than fatherlessness in some cases. Um, so, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. Mom loved me. She did the best she could. Um, but, uh, yeah, a lot of fatherlessness, a lot of trauma. How, how old were you with the... With the with, with being shot at, I was a teenager, nineteen, I think, eighteen. <sighs> wow. So, what what happened to even start that whole mess that night? I mean, obviously I the alcohol I came in. I don't know. I came in. Mom always kept a very clean house, and there were magazines and furniture and crap all over the house. A broken lamp and. Um, the kitchen was through the living room. And so I walked, I was walking through the living room, kind of like, you know, I've seen plenty of fights and I've seen dysfunction, but I hadn't seen that level of it yet. Mom comes running by me screaming and he comes out and he's wasted. And, um, there were some stairways that led to a small landing to the upstairs and mom was at the landing And so I naturally just went into the kitchen to, I wasn't making a sandwich for goodness sakes. I was going to look around and I heard him say, um, something about you need to see this coming. And I walked back out of the kitchen and he was on the far end of the living room with a gun aimed up at her at the landing. And I'm like, I don't know what I said, but it was something like, no, whatever. And he said, this isn't any of your business. And he leveled it off at me and I took off running down a hallway and I heard the first pow and a bullet going by your head kind of sounds like, it sounds sounds like a B. And, um, I actually remember the coat hangers in the closet where the bullet went through rattling because that's where the bullet went. And then as I jumped through the doorway, I heard another round go off and I raised the window, jumped out went to my neighbors, called the cops and, uh, cops showed up and that was the end of that evening. Jeez, man. Um, I was on a hunting trip with my 15 year old and it was a guided hunting trip and there was other guides out there and with other hunters and we, there were shots fired in our direction and the guide was like, get down. And I never, I'd never heard, but, but, but bullets were like whizzing over our heads and we could hear them. So I've, I've heard that sound. It does. It's like, yeah. So it was pretty crazy, man. Um, 
My gosh, man. So what, what happened to that relationship? Was that the end of it after that? Um, she took him back and then, uh, then they finally divorced. And, uh, one of the things I think we need to teach our children is grace and forgiveness. Um, and so shortly before he died, I forgave him. He died penniless and, uh, was from a little town in Arkansas and, um, didn't have any money to bury him or anything. And he didn't have any thing and he was cremated and put in a, a box, a pine box about the size of a shoe box. And, um, I, and a couple of guys that he knew, uh, went over and found a, a cemetery and hit the town that he was originally born in and actually dug the hole and buried him. Wow. That is, that is unreal. That is absolutely unreal. So you you said your mom though was married five times. Was there also men that she was you know, dating in between? Oh yeah, sure. Were they all kind of the same? Just there were a couple in there that I thought were pretty good guys, but they didn't last or hang around. I'll tell you what happens. I I lettered in six sports in high school, um, and my father uh, actually held the 100-yard dash record in Shelby County until the late 90s. He was a great athlete. He was started at quarterback and point guard for four years at East High School, and I knew he was into sports. And that was back in the day when I played that, you know, your local newspaper always put box scores for the high schools in the newspaper and did articles, and I was in the paper plenty. And, um, you know, I knew my dad. And we sh I share the same name. I'm a junior. And so I knew my father saw me, you know, and he never saw a game I played or anything. And so, you know, you get to a place, you know, you may be a 16, 17 year old kid that's tough and got all these, you know, you're playing sports and you're working out and everything, but inside you still have fears and inhibitions and self-consciousness. And, you know, you get to a point when so many men coming in and out of your life that you quit thinking that the men are screwed up and you start to wonder what's wrong with you. You know, I mean, I must lack that. What, what about me is so wrong that I'm so valueless that no man is willing to stick around in my life and be permanent for me. And so what happens is that kind of, dysfunction and trauma manifests itself in a way that you start to think of yourself as not valuable as you are. And when you don't think of yourself as very valuable, that's when you start engaging in behavior that's destructive. And so when we think about what's going on in a lot of parts of our society across the country where fatherlessness is rampant, and sometimes generational, uh, and we see young kids who are born as infants with the same amount of uh, capabilities as the next, but we can't consistently see certain segments of our society engaging in behavior that's destructive, where they wind up incarcerated, jobless, or in jail, and we continue to ask ourselves, you know, what do we do to break that cycle? I would submit to you that we have to instill in a lot of these kids who've been through a lot of trauma as a result of fatherlessness that they are valuable. And um, that despite the chaos surrounding them, they, they, it's not their fault. It's that guy's fault that was a sperm donor who decided he didn't want to invest in you. And, um, there's a, a serious, um, societal and generational, um, piece of trauma that we continue to heap on some of the most disadvantaged young men in our communities across this country. And I'm one of them. And I understand, um, I understand how that makes you feel and then how it manifests itself in the way you carry yourself. And, a lot of kids can't come back from that, and it's a shame. Have you found that – so you, your upbringing and mine is pretty similar. 
I was never shot at, uh, but I did have a knife held to my throat at one point. Um, some really s- scary stuff, but never shot at. <clears throat> but the shooting, like, the sh- I want to say something. The shooting is bad. Yeah, but that's not the worst of it. It's the abandonment and the isolation that you feel that's far worse than being shot at or having a knife held to your throat. The knife and the shooting and the knife and all that stuff, that's the sensationalism of the story. Right. The heart of the story is the is the um is is what that that consistent habitual abandonment and loss does to a young man's psyche over time. I 100% agree. So my mom was married three times. Yours was five. That my <clears throat> our my childhood was just like yours. It was like this revolving door of different men. Half of childhood was spent without a father figure. The other half was spent with some. Some one or two were nice, but they were all pretty much the same type of dudes. Just heavy partiers, heavy drinkers, some drug use, and you know, abusive and just absolute chaos. I'm curious though, in your, in your experience, you know, being a coach for as long as you have, and, you know, you see these, these young men, these, these players that, that play for you. Right. And then you get to know them and, and, and you coming from the background that you do. And I'm curious is you're, you see these young men and you see that they maybe are just like you. They, maybe they were abandoned, didn't have a father figure or, and then the flip side. So two different situations. One is that the second one is, you know, you have a player that has a father in his life, but just treats him terribly. Right. Or just treats him like, just beats him down relentlessly. Right. And for, for people like me and you, I honestly think that's very triggering to see that because you know exactly what it feels like, but I'm curious, how, how have you handled that over the years? Well, you got to go back just a little to counterbalance the dysfunction of my life. I had some, I had two good grandfathers. I got to admit that they were great. Um, it's still a 15 year old has a hard time relating to a 65 year old and it's not a father, but I did have grandfathers love me, but the people that really counterbalanced the trauma and the dysfunction of my life were my coaches. And I think the reason I lettered in six sports is because I just wanted to be around something positive. And the coaches meant so much to me. And I got in a fight my freshman year in high school. And the guy I got in a fight with was kind of a jackass, but I was too. Anyway, back then when you got into fights, you didn't go to the principal's office. You went to the coach's office. And trust me, the coach's office was 50 times worse. Right. Go, right. You know, hundred percent. Oh yeah. And I, w- I went to coach Spain's office and I knew I was about to get lit up and <laughs> was dreading it primarily yeah. because I was going to get lit up, but also because this is a coach I really cared about that sh- yeah. was good to me. And I felt like, you know, anyway, I sit down and I expect to get it given to me. And coach Spain was the son of a cotton farmer in Milan, Tennessee. He was a old school black and white bread and butter guy who was a good X's and O's football coach, but tough, but fair, but also had that, that ability to, you just knew he gave a crap about you as a person. And so when I sat in his office door shut, it was a completely different reaction from him than what I expected. And he just said, why are you getting into fights? And I said, coach, I'm just so angry all the time. And I, you know, I'm just mad. And he said, I understand. He said, you know what? You probably deserve to be mad. He said, I I know what you're dealing with and I know what you've dealt with at home. And I know some of your sadness and I know your dad never comes to the games and I know all of it. He said, um, he said, you know what? Nobody can blame you for being angry. And he said, but you're 15 now, you're a big boy and you have a choice to make. And he said, the first choice is be a victim to it, succumb. He said, no one could blame you for it. You've had more dysfunction and more crap going on in your life than most people ever will already at 15. And you know what? You can succumb to it. You can be a victim of it. But what that choice looks like 
is when you're 30, you're probably going to lose a job or two. You'll probably be divorced and you won't be around your kids and you'll end up being just like the very people that are making you miserable today. And he said, so if you want to succumb to it all and be a victim of it, that's a choice you can make. And you're going to spend a lot of time answering to guys like me, except they're not going to be coaches eventually. They're probably going to be judges, law enforcement, and everything else. And he said, or you can decide you're better than that. You can recognize that that dysfunction doesn't define you. You can recognize that that dysfunction is not you. And you can dig your heels in the dirt and decide you're going to be a rock that those dysfunctional people break themselves on. So that's a choice. So are you going to be a victim or are you going to be a rock? Now, I would like to say that epiphany changed me that very minute, but it didn't. I thought about it, though, and for a year, every time I got frustrated, I thought about those words. And little by little, by my junior in high school, I decided I was denouncing and ridding myself of that dysfunction and chaos. And I was going to lead a different life and my children would never know the life that I knew. And I was going to be a rock that dysfunction broke itself on. Um, and so um, it is with that background of the dysfunction, but also the background of incredible men like Coach Spain, who taught me fundamental values and tenets of ways to break out of that situation that I coach football and that I run my business and that I am a husband and a father is that I'm going to be a rock against dysfunction and trauma and chaos um, and uh, lead a life that doesn't allow me to be a victim of my circumstances. So I'd love to dive into the guardrails and the rules that you follow to do those very things, right? Because a lot of us, if we've been through trauma, we get caught up in that. And, you know, it, it completely throws us off the rails. So I, I want to ask you about that. But while you think about that, just a quick reflection on, and what was the coach's name that you went into? Philip Spain. He's passed coach. away. He died about a year and a half ago, but Coach Spain. Okay. You know, hats off to that man, right? You know, me, oh, like... like what me like, yeah, what a guy. I mean, those, dude, I will never forget. And this is where I think like, man, this one's going to make me emotional a little bit. Like just remembering it. I remember I was about 15 and I was wrestling and I had this coach that was like, he just scared the shit out of me, he scared the shit out of all of us. Like we called him the bear. So his name was coach O'Brien. And I swear this guy has zero emotions in him whatsoever. Like he just barked, yelled, but man, he, he freaking drove us to, to greatness. Like he pushed us. Right. And I so appreciate that. And there were, there was a time when I was about 15 and it was right when my mom was, we had this other guy move in with us. Me, like you, I had a great grandfather, just awesome guy who's positive role model to counterbalance all that. But there was this one dude that lived with us for like two years and just wasn't, a nightmare. Or he was the guy that did the knife thing and all that. And um, I'll never forget being, I felt so isolated, so desperate. And I don't know what it is in me, but Coach O'Brien was like the last person in the world that I, because my relationship with him was very surface, like, you know, wrestling and that was it. And I wrote him a letter one time, and for some reason, man, I just had no idea, no idea, even still to this day, I don't know why I picked him, but I wrote him a letter just explaining, like, I'm in a really bad place at home. I don't think he had any idea. I was like, I'm in a really bad place at home. Like, I don't even want to be home. Like, I just mentally, like, I'm trying to take all my aggressions out on the wrestling mat, but for some reason, that's just not working anymore. I feel really, really horrible. And I think I even mentioned the words in there at some point that I don't even know if I should be here anymore. Meaning like, I just didn't see a way out of my house and I didn't see a way out of anything. And I didn't want to talk to anybody about it. And I didn't, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'll never forget. He also taught, taught my English class and he was very matter of fact, nothing was personal. And he he was, uh, after class was over, he came up to me and he, he tapped my desk and you know, he just came up to my desk. He goes, 
come see me after school for practice. And he just walked away. And I went into his office and he sat me down and he had actually met the guy that my mom was living with because he came to like one of our banquets. And I went into his office and I was like, kind of like you, I was like, oh my God, like, what have I done? Like, this is not going to be good. He's going to make me run. Like he's going to yell at me or whatever. And that guy sat on the couch and he sat next to me and he put his arm around me and I'm like, what in the heck is going on? Like this guy was not that type of dude. And he goes, Larry, what is going on at home? And dude, I like, he was one of those guys too. Like, like there's no crying in baseball, you know, league of their own. He was, if, if a guy walked off the mat crying, you were running. Like there was no, he was, there was no crying. And I just lost it, man. And I told him everything that was going on, told him about, the abuse and like how this guy pulled a knife on me and like was beating my mom and I didn't know what to do. And I was just like, I'm just like, I'm lost, man. I'm just lost. And that guy had so much freaking compassion, man. I could not even, I, I had to like keep looking at him and be like, is this the same dude? Is this the same coach? And he's like, Larry, he's like, listen, man, ever since I met that guy at the, at the banquet, I, I knew he was bad, bad news. He's like, don't give up wrestling. He's like, I share that with you not because I need you as a wrestler. He goes, I share that with you because it's something positive in your life. And he's like, as long as I know what's going on here, I'll take, uh, I'll take care of you. I got you. And from then on out, that rest of the year, like wrestling became like literally the thing, I swear, that kept me centered. And, and, the, and we never talked about it again. And I never told any of my teammates either. And that was something like between me and him, but I swear to God, man, it was that moment that kept me going. Well, and, that, and I mean, Audi 48 and you still talk about it today and you yeah. get back in your 15, 16 year old brain when you say it, um, which is the same way I feel like when I think of God, I'm 55 years old. And, um, when I talk about coach Spain, my mind reverts to being a 15 year old little boy because, um, guys like that can alter lives and, um, you know, in coaching, mentoring, um, any type of leadership position that you have that opportunity every day and you have no idea. You just, you really don't have any idea of the opportunity you have every day to, have, to exact some measure of positive change on another very hurt human being, because we oftentimes don't know what people are carrying with them. And, um, you know, I, I, um, I, I feel exactly what you're saying and you don't have to talk about it again, because at least, you know, you got one decent person in your corner and yeah. it makes all the difference in the world. It did for me. Yeah. Um, with my coaches. And that's why I wanted to coach is because, um, you know, I knew damn good and well when I graduated from college that it had not been for sports and the coaches in my life that, that helped mentor, uh, and advise me along the way that I don't, I, I really don't know what I ended up doing. You know, I, it was a calling for me coaching. And, and, you know, it, yeah, I mean, I can definitely see why. And so, you know, back to the question, I'm so curious as to when you see these situations, right? One fatherless home, one being that there's a father in the house, but it's not a good situation. Guys like me and you, I think that there's something that is triggered in us. You know, it's just like, man, like it's just, we, we feel very strongly about it, that situation, but I'd love for you to talk through it. You do, but either, I mean this, you can either be a victim of it or you can yeah. Above it, and you can allow those in your charge to be victims of it, or you can show them fundamentals and characteristics and tenets that help you to rise above it. And I don't think that um, allowing anybody in your orbit to be a victim of chaos does them any favors. Um, it, I would even say it's the opposite of empathy. I think true empathy is is about um, helping people to rise above their circumstances not dismissing the pain of circumstances, but 
helping people have tools to rise above them. Um, you just, you can't allow yourself to be a victim to crap. We all have crap in one way or another in our lives. Um, so are you going to fall prey to it or are you going to have that crap break it, break on you? It, it really is a choice. Um, and so you're right when I'm coaching kids and I see all of that and at Manassas, that's all that I saw. My goal was not to be an overly empathetic, um, an overly empathetic guy who allowed the circumstances to defeat them, but rather to say, I get it, I understand it, I feel it, and it sucks, but here's a different way to lead your life so that you too don't end up in the exact same way that, you, that you're surrounded by. Very much like what Coach Spain said to me. You know, it's, do you find that young men with these types of situations, do you find that more often than not, it tends to hurt their performance and hurt their mentality when they're in an environment like sports or is it the action, is it the opposite or do you see a mixture of both? You see a mixture of both, but for your listeners, I think it's important to remember because I believe it, what I said earlier is that Fatherlessness is not what causes the problem. It's the trauma and dysfunction as a result of fatherlessness that yeah. is habitual. Where as a young man, you start to look in the mirror and think, something's wrong with me. If yeah. no man sees enough value in me to invest in me, there must be something intrinsically wrong with me. And then when you start to have a low self-value, you have a low self-respect, then you're more apt to engage in behaviors that are detrimental to your mental, physical, spiritual well-being. And so, yes, I have seen that situation affect kids on the playing field, affect kids off the playing field. I have seen kids use the playing field as their outlet, and they're amazing in a sport, but in their personal life, they're complete wreck. And then I've also seen kids overcome it. I think that is where the role of a good mentor and a good coach can come in is to help empathize with and say, I understand what you're going through, but try to make the point that you can be a victim to it and end up just like it, or you can decide you're going to break it and then give fundamentals and tenets like character, commitment, integrity, the dignity and hard work, the importance of showing up on time, how to be a good teammate, how to be a good leader, how to be a good follower, and then illustrate those tenets in the way that you interact with your team, the way you interact with the people at work, the way you interact with your children to emulate a, a different way to lead a life, to break the proverbial string. And, um, I think that's a, uh, I think that's a, a, a really valuable effort to engage in from a coach's or leader standpoint. It's, it's just old school servant leadership. It's leading by serving, but you have to understand serving is not allowing somebody to be a victim. Serving is not helicoptering. You learn from failure, you grow from failure. You have to let the people, your children, your employees, your players, you have to let them fail. You can't, you, you can't be, you can't, you can't empathize so much that you then cripple whoever you seek to lead by not allowing them to fail. Also, it's a fine balance. It's a fine walk, but done properly, it, it, it not only can change the lives of people you seek to lead, but it will change your life as a result of, <laughs> of having a renewed and continued um, belief in the power of the human spirit. So when, when it comes to our own traumas, right, you've been through trauma, I've been through trauma, you can either be a victim or you, you can make other choices that are going to be better. When, when you in the past have been faced with 
call it, say, just victim traits that might show up for you by default, right? Just They just happen to us, right? They happen to anybody, even with or without trauma. But I'm very, very curious with your mentality. Like I, the story I'm telling myself, Bill, is that you're very astute at probably recognizing those for what they are and then making a very different decision, right? But I think, you know, the question I have for you is when these default triggers, right, or when we just the any anybody who we are, it doesn't matter if we have trauma or not, when we want to go in that victim mindset, how do you head that off at the pass and then make sure that we're like, no, I'm not a victim. I'm This is what I'm going to do. There are, well, my book, Against the Grain, is right. these tenets, right? But those tenets that are in that book, I think, are fundamentally um, what you got to employ to have a successful life, whether it's coaching football, running a business, being an employee, being a player, being a father, whatever. And I, I think the way to... to Look, if someone's feeling bad about themselves or if someone is a victim to a circumstance and they're under your charge, you're not going to say anything that's going to immediately change that. It is a process. And the process looks like teaching the fundamentals and the tenets that lead to a meaningful life, illustrating them by the way you lead and walk in your life and in all aspects of it, as a coach, as a leader, as a manager, as a father, as a husband, all of them. And being incredibly consistent in how you use those fundamentals in your life and how you illustrate them in your walk through life. And then the most important thing is holding those you seek to lead accountable. Um, which may be the one that people miss the most is the accountability portion is that you can empathize, you can teach, you can love, and you can talk all you want. But if you continue to excuse bad behavior and there is no accountability, you are in fact allowing a victim to continue to grow. You like enabling. Have, you have to hold people accountable to those, but the accountability piece doesn't work until the person you seek to lead understands you're vested in them. And the way they understand you're vested in them is you listen to them, you understand them, you empathize with them, you you seek to help quell their fears, you seek to help quell their inhibitions, you seek to help exalt whatever their dreams are, you serve them. And then if someone recognizes that in the leadership position, coach, boss, father, husband, whatever, that your efforts are always going to be to lead them through service. Then when you turn and have to hold them accountable, when they misstep, they're likely to take that accountability measure because they understand you're only doing it because you love them and you care about them. So you do all those things, but that accountability is the most important part, but you can't institute accountability if you are fraudulent, if you aren't a servant. And if you aren't walking those fundamentals in your own life, but if you do that and then hold accountable, you have a chance to make a difference. Can you share a story that in from your past that really hits that home? I mean, <laughs> you don't I mean, have, I know there's probably tons, you don't have a 10 hour podcast. I, I'll, t- I'll tell you this story. Okay. Um, I think the greatest measure of the effectiveness of a leader. Now, before I keep going, a leader is a father, a husband, a boss, a football coach, somebody leading in a nonprofit, somebody leading uh, in their optimist club, in their community, whatever, whatever position of leadership you have, okay, from a father all the way up and back down the spectrum. I think the greatest measure of the effectiveness of a leader is the actions of the followers. So if you're in some kind of leadership position like a dad and your kids aren't doing the right thing at school or socially or with the crowd they're hanging out with or whatever, before you jump down their throat, if the greatest measure of the effectiveness of a leader is the actions of followers, before you jump down their throat, you might want to look in the mirror. Are you illustrating 
the very things that you want your children to be. I always told my sons that I always knew that how I treated Lisa is how my sons would treat their wives. So if I talked one thing and treated Lisa a different way, then my sons would treat their wife ultimately that way because they do what they see. Maybe even more importantly, I knew my daughters would expect to be treated the way I treated my wife. If I was abusive, if I was mean, if I wasn't loving, if I wasn't empathetic, then they wouldn't seek that from a man in their own life. And and so I knew that my illustration as a husband to Lisa was an illustration to my sons and daughters about what their relationships with their spouses one day would look like. So again, if the greatest effect, the greatest measure of the effect of his leaders, the actions of followers, you have to understand that everything you do is an illustration to those you seek to lead about how they will both lead and expect to be led. So my first year at Manassas, when I showed up there, uh, I found 19 kids and their previous 10 years record was four wins and 96 losses. They were terrible. Four, 96 in 10 years, 17 kids on a high school football team. And uh, it was clear we needed to coach X's and O's, but it was also clear we need to start teaching all the fundamentals we're talking about, character, commitment, integrity, all that stuff. And so we did. Halfway through the season, we were three wins and three losses. Now, I think three and three is kind of average, but when you've won four games in 10 years, they thought I was like a fat redheaded version of Pete Carroll or somebody. And so the whole team was yes, sir, no, sir, and into the football. But the minute football was over, half the kids were doing their homework, being respectful in the classroom, really working on following these tenets, right? These, these value systems that they were being held accountable to. The other half the team, while yes or no on the football field, buying into the, all the football stuff because we were winning games, the minute practices or games were over, they were still back. They were back in the streets. They were back engaging the same destructive behavior that got them to 496 in the first place. And so I went to my guy. Every coach has a guy, and I went to my guy, and I said, hey, man, what do I got to do to get that half the team to buy into the important stuff like your half the team? And this is the guy who had a lot of real conversations with me, and and I knew he'd tell me the truth, and instead he just kind of looked at me and dismissively said, oh, coach, just keep doing what you're doing. And I'm like, no, man, real talk. He said, coach, you don't want to hurt your feelings. I said, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Why can't I get that half the team to buy into the important stuff like your half the team? And he said, Coach, you're just trying to figure out if you're a turkey person or not. So what I did, what's the hell, a turkey person? Yeah, what is that? He said, man, Coach, every Thanksgiving and Christmas, people roll into our neighborhoods, and they give us gifts and hams and turkeys, and we take them because we ain't got none. But then they leave, and we never see them again. Makes you wonder if they're doing that because they really care about us or they're doing that to make themselves feel good. He looked me dead in the eyes and he said, really, coach, what the hell are you doing down here in the hood? Remember, the greatest measure of the effectiveness of leaders, the actions of the followers. And I had half my team that were following on the football field, but not the important stuff. And I was mad at them. If you serve soup in a soup kitchen or give away gifts at the holidays or turkeys on Thanksgiving to the needy. It's a beautiful thing. Don't misunderstand the story. The story is to, to ask you this, what's your motive? What's your motive? Because the truth is anybody, anytime, anybody that first year asked me about Manassas, they'd be like Manassas, man, they're the worst team in Memphis. Huh? You three and three, man, tell me more. Yeah, I got them taking ACT prep classes. What else? Well, I got them new equipment. What else? Well, I got them new uniforms. What else? Well, I got some of them doing homework and really working on the grades. Well, I mean, anytime anybody asked me anything about Manassas, I was all too happy to tell them everything I was doing. Meanwhile, <clears throat> some of these kids were getting called sellouts. Man, homework's for chumps. They were adhering to these fundamentals and tenets that I was holding accountable to, to be part of one positive thing in their life in the middle of a terrible area. But every time anybody asked me anything about them, I was all too happy to tell them everything I was doing. Because the other thing about the great 
traits of leadership is leaders always give credit to the followers when things go well. Yeah. Right. So I started changing my behavior and that's what went to 17 kids, four wins and 95 losses to seven years later, 75 kids on the team and a record of 18 and two our last two years. And that's why a documentary that won the Academy Awards was made off of it because of the kids. So all this to say, um, when you're in a leadership position, again, boss, coach, whatever, father, spouse, what's your motive? If you're motivated to serve in order to lead, if you're motivated to, to do everything you can to help those around you be better, if you're motivated by the excitement you get because someone else does something in their life in a good way, and then you give them credit, then you're motivated properly. If you're motivated because you want the headlines, the corner office, the bigger paycheck, there's nothing wrong with being exceptional. But if your motive is specifically for you, the people you seek to lead will say yes or no, sir, because they have to. You're in that position. But the minute you turn and walk away, they'll start darts through your back because they know they're looking at a fraud. And that includes your children. We have to serve to lead. We have to listen. We have to illustrate. We have to be motivated by the right things. And then once we, we win their hearts and minds through that service, then we hold accountable. And when you do that, things change. And if you will always measure the success of your leadership position in terms of the actions of those you seek to lead and you see actions you don't like, look in the mirror and figure it out because more times than not, it's your problem, not theirs. Man, that's, <clears throat> that is really, really good. What have you found as far as motives go like so for instance bill again the story i'm telling myself is you're motivated by things that are much bigger than you know glory and fame and all these other things that you know but, never saw any of that out it just kind of yeah. came along now do you think that those things happen because your motives were in the right spot no i think those things happened because of the people i led became exceptional. You get a thousand times more out of it than you put into it. That's the payoff. Albert Pike, a 19th century Freemason said, what you do for yourself in this life dies and is buried with you. What you do for others remains immortal. And it's so true. If you serve and you're motivated by the right things and you adhere to basic fundamentals and values and tenets all the way through your life and you hold people accountable to them, what the payoff is, is that you get a thousand times more back out of it than what you put into it. And I'm just a living example. Man, I own a lumber company in Memphis and I coach high school football. I got a book. I got an Academy Award. I've been on Ellen DeGeneres and Jimmy Kimmel. I speak all over the country. I've keynoted the Olympic team before they went off the Olympics. All of these things. And I'm not saying it to brag. I'm just saying it's a result of all these things that happened in my life. And it all happened because of the people I seek to serve were so exceptional that um, people want to understand how it happened. And that came back to me. And I mean, that's the blessing of all of it, but you have to be motivated by the exaltation of someone who's just not as blessed as you are. I love that, man. Do you mind if we, if we wrap up with talking about the accountability piece? Yeah, sure. So holding people accountable, right? Whether it's your kids, team, you know, whatever it is, conversations around. So two different types of questions here. What does it look like for a day in the life with Bill to hold somebody accountable when they've achieved, held their word, and they've done everything that they're supposed to do? What, is that, what does that praise look like from you to that person? And then on the, the other question is when someone is not doing what they're supposed to do and they're not pulling their weight and what they agreed to do, what does that conversation look like? There's a story under every helmet, and they're all different. Um, I have 130 employees and there are high achievers 
excellers, middle of the road guys, and low achievers. Same on a football field, frankly, same in a family. Um, so the accountability piece looks different to every yeah. single person you seek to work with, but you can't understand how that accountability piece looks until you understand the person you're charged with leading. So you have to ask lots of questions. You have to listen. You have to truly understand people's goals and dreams and fears. And if you hold yourself to the standard that my success as a leader is directly reflected on me by the actions of the followers, there comes a time you got to hold people accountable when you've addressed every step you know how to address, but that accountability looks very different depending on the person you're dealing with. So I can't tell you how that accountability looks because it does change with every person. But I, I will tell you this in general, um, if it's at work, uh, I will ask a lot of questions, which is I, I want to make sure that I wasn't a poor communicator. So, did you understand that X was required today? And then that's a yes or no. If no, I didn't understand that. Well, now that's interesting because we had a meeting, blah, blah, blah. Here's something that you signed in your file, blah, 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 that says you did understand that. Well, I forgot. And you just keep asking questions. If someone says, no, I wasn't aware. Okay, well, then we need to discuss why you weren't aware. Or I was aware. Well, if you are aware that you can't do X, can you tell me why you did X anyway? Because it's either you decide to abjectly ignore my instruction or you thought you had a better way. And I need to discuss that. What I'm saying is you ask questions and you allow somebody to engage with you as an adult. You allow somebody to engage with you as a young adult. You... I don't believe in just dropping the hammer my way, the highway and beating someone into submission. I want to have a conversation because every human being has value and therefore every position in human being is salvageable and you're not going to salvage them by throwing them in the garbage or beating them to death. You, you can hold people accountable by asking questions, listening and correcting and every opportunity for accountability is an opportunity as a teaching moment and it's an opportunity a learning moment for you to learn more about that person who, who you're charged with leading. So that's what accountability looks like. Now with high schoolers on a football field, it's a little different because they're younger and their brains aren't fully developed and they're a little more impetuous. And oftentimes they don't have to be on your team. They don't need the job and the paycheck, but it's still the same thing, asking questions. And, and then, uh, the last thing is making the point that people are always forgiven if they want to be always grace is imperative, but there's a difference in forgiveness and a pardon. I will always forgive you for what you've done wrong. If you ask me to forgive you. I always want to be forgiven when I do something wrong, if I ask you to forgive me. That's 100% sacrosanct. We always show one another grace on a football field, in a business, in our family, whatever. But there's a difference in forgiveness and pardon. I may forgive you, but you still have to pay the consequences because that's what accountability looks like. And so we also have that conversation routinely when accountability comes into play. So, I mean, I love this. I, I love the forgiveness and pardon part. I mean, I, lo I love the whole thing, but I've never heard it quite like that. And that's, that is really, really good. It so, is. I, I mean, people often like you will have devoutly um, Christian folks who've had a family member murdered and the person's on death row. And they legitimately forgive the people that murdered their family member. 
I don't know that I have that level of grace in my heart. Thank God I've never been put in that position. But I will tell you, I just find it incredulous that people have that level of grace that they can forgive a stranger that took someone they loved from them. But it doesn't mean that if I forgive you, I don't think you need to do time the rest of your life. And that is the distinction that some might call a fine line, but I think it's actually a, a, a very bold line that you have to understand. And, and that example is the extreme, but you know, a, a kid that decides to break two team rules on my football team, I don't want to kick him off the team. I want to show him what grace and forgiveness looks like because I want him to offer grace and forgiveness to the next person that does something wrong to him. Our jails are full of people who didn't understand how to forgive, who didn't understand how to engage in a civil conversation about a disagreement. Our jails are full of people who did not know how to control their emotions because they have no idea what grace and forgiveness looks like. And if they did have an idea what grace and forgiveness looks like and the ability to communicate, I would say our jails would have a far, a, a much lower population. So it's important to me that we teach that in everything we do. But again, you, if a kid breaks those rules, I'm going to show them grace and forgiveness. We're going to talk through that, but they're then they're also going to pay the piper because that's the accountability piece. That's it. I like that. I really like that a lot. I want to, I want to give you some time here to, you know, I know you've got, uh, a podcast that's in the top 10 of all podcasts. So congratulations on that. Thanks. Uh, I would, I would love for you to share your podcast and any other resources, your book, um, as well. It's it, uh, anything. It's, yeah. I appreciate that. It's real simple there. I, I think, um, I think the national media is incented by an enormous amount of power and money to keep us divided. I think our federal government and as, as, as partisan and divided as we've become are also incented by enormous power and wealth to keep us divided. And as such, we're infiltrated with all these narratives based on the categories we separate ourselves into. And I think it's destructive. I think it's destructive for the health of our country. I think it's destructive for our personal health. We need to quit just surrounding ourselves with people that only think like us, look like us, vote like us, love like us, and worship like us. The only way we're going to grow as a society is to seek to understand those that are a little different from us. Um, and I, I just, um, I'm frustrated by it. I'm tired of it. And so I was asked what it was going to take to fix it in an interview about a year and a half ago. And I said, an army of normal folks, there's guys like you and me seeking to understand each other, uh, an army of normal folks seeing places of need in their community and just filling it where their passion and their ability meets opportunity. And they came back to me about a six, seven months later and said, you know, we love that idea about what you said about Army Normal folks. We'd like to start podcasts where you interview normal people all over the country that nobody's ever heard of doing extraordinary things in their community and tell their stories. And so I said, that sounds cool. And we've been, uh, we've been live for four months now and we release every Tuesday. So tomorrow will be our next episode. And they're just really well-produced, interesting, entertaining stories of people you've probably never heard of that have done unbelievable things in our community. And they are black people, white people, Hispanic people, Asian people, male, female, right, left, uh, a great cross section of people from all over our country who are doing extraordinary things in our country. And all we're doing is celebrating their leadership, their service, their love for community. And I don't care how you vote, how you worship, where you come from. That's one thing we can all celebrate in unison together, regardless of what category you found yourself in. And so the podcast called An Army of Normal Folks, it should be entertaining. It should be redemptive. It should be well-produced, but most importantly, hopefully it's inspirational that if you listen long enough, you'll hear stories about things that you too can do in your community to help lead and serve. Um, so that's it. You can go to normalfolks.us. You can go to An Army of Normal Folks on Apple. Um, with regard to my book and Undefeated, the movie and all that, you can go to coachbillcourtney.com and get the book. 
Uh, I think undefeated. I know it's on Amazon Prime. I think it's still on Netflix, so you can watch that there. And, you know, uh, this is n not about me. I don't get a bunch of royalties off any of it. It is all in an effort to get people to maybe think about things a little different way, like the title of the book, Go Against the Grain, and join the proverbial army of normal folks, and let's see if we can't serve and lead in our communities to uh, make a better lives for our kids. Man, this has been awesome. We're going to have, uh, I, I jotted those in the show notes here, uh, normalfolks.us. Uh, you can also find that anywhere you download podcast guys. Also coach bill Uh, you can find all kinds of resources over there as well. Uh, for, for coach, coach bill himself, you can check out some of his speaking, speaking resources, his books, his podcast, blog events, and everything. Uh, we'll have all those links in the show notes. All you guys will have to do is head on over to the dad edge.com forward slash Friday one three zero for the show. Again, the dad edge.com forward slash Friday one three zero. Uh, Coach Bill, I took tons of notes as you were talking, and uh, this has been truly inspirational. And I appreciate what you're doing out there, man. You're just definitely giving us some gems of how we can be better leaders as men, and even for the guy, you know, for the guys who are listening to this podcast. If you're a dad, a husband, you're a leader, and, and we need more, more, um, more skills around that, more, more guardrails around that, more ways to do that better. And you definitely gave that to us today, so thank you so much. Man, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed being with you. Same here. Same here. Gentlemen, like I said, head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash Friday 130 for this show. Go out and live legendary. Take care.